Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta. And in this episode, we are going to look at governance issues that have been thrown up by the recent legal tussle involving the Tata Group and Cyrus Mystery. And whereas we're not going to discuss details or the legalities of this tussle, they're going to talk about the issues that have been thrown up by this high profile legal dispute. With me here in the studio, I'm happy to welcome Sarvesh Mathur. He's a senior finance professional. Earlier was the chief finance officer of Tata Telecom, also the chief finance officer of PricewaterhouseCoopers, and formerly a company secretary of Alcatel Modi Network Systems. And for the benefit of our viewers, Sarvesh Mathur blew the whistle on irregularities that were going on in PWH. Price Waterhouse Coopers is internationally renowned. It's one of the biggest audit firms of its kind in the world. Thank you, Mathurji, for being with us. Uh, you. Would you like to summarize what, according to you, were the main governance issues thrown up by the Tata mystery uh, tussle without getting into the legalities of it. In the context of the article that you've recently written for Money Life called The Crucial But Unspoken Governance Issues Exposed by the Tata Mystery Saga. Uh, thank you, Paranjoy. Uh, as you have rightly put it, the main theme of my article is on the corporate governance uh, and the challenges which it, it has thrown up. Uh, in terms of the Tata mystery saga, I think the, one of the, there are two or three main issues which are coming out. One, and I think the foremost of them is that is it a good corporate practice for a private limited company to be the holding company of a very large group controlling more than 100 entities, which includes 29 listed companies having turnover of more than $100 billion dollars which has millions of shareholders and which Operate operates in, in more than 160 that's countries. Right. And, and employs over 660,000 people. People and it has millions of shareholders. So that, I think, uh, that is the focus of my, uh, was the focus so of my article. So you're saying that from a pure corporate governance angle, yeah. Tata Sons, which enjoys the privileges of a private limited company, should not be controlling such a huge corporate conglomerate or empire. And why do you say so? Is it because a private limited company does not have to adhere to certain norms of good corporate governance, which a public limited company, a widely held public limited company has? And what really are these differences between a public limited company a private limited company, a closely held public limited company, and a widely held public limited company yes. whose shares are available, uh, whose shares are uh, available uh, or, or are sold uh, in the stock exchanges to large numbers of people. Uh, as, I, as we said at the beginning, since this matter is subjudious, it will not be fair to go into the legalities. I am looking at it more like a student of management a student of corporate governance. And for me, the main issues, two or three main issues which are coming out of this, I am not for a moment saying that Tata Sun should not be doing this. But as I said, I am only looking at it as a case study. Because the focus is on corporate governance, it is largely today's SEBI's gui SEBI guidelines are also focused on listed entities only. You see, as you rightly said, you have private limited companies, you have public limited companies, you have listed company, of these public listed companies could be listed, they could be unlisted. That means they're closely held or widely held? Not even that. It depends on the public shareholding, mass shareholding. Okay. And then you have organizations like NGOs, trusts. For me, the main point is governance should be all encompassing. This fine distinction between private limited, public limited, charitable, non-charitable, trust, should not be there. You know, it is like saying this, Paranjoy. Let me give you a very simple example. What I say, good values have to be imbibed. 
they have to be imbibed from your childhood from infancy right so just because you don't say i mean no good parent would tell a child that it is good for it is acceptable if you tell a lie till you attain the age of majority you know good values have to be done have to be imbibed from from the inception so this distinction of you know sebi guidelines or corporate governance norms applying to a certain type of companies in my view needs a relook i am not for a moment saying that apply the same yardstick to everyone why i am not saying that is because for reasons of operational flexibility for protection of intellectual property rights know how technology etc we you cannot have one size with fits all some kind of moderation has to be done but then to leave some outside the ambit altogether and only focus on some uh, is is an area which i think needs a lot of debate and then the, the, that is why i am saying that for tata for for any company why only tata sells any company because there would be so many holding companies like this who could be organized as a private limited companies so while the companies that they control are subject to corporate governance norms the very company which the parent is not subject to corporate governance norms that is an area i think we need to look at okay in your article you've sort of gone back to the origin of the companies act before independence then soon after less than a decade after independence when you had the companies act of 1956 and you pointed out that there was a specific provision in the companies act of 1956 that is 43a which stated clearly that private companies would be considered public companies under three different scenarios when more than 25% of the share capital is held by one or more corporate entities two when the average turnover during a particular period exceeded a particular specified amount uh, which i suppose would change from time to time and three when not less than 25% of the share capital of a public of a public company was held by a private limited company now when the new companies act came into being in 2013 it removed this section Dimi. altogether yeah, this deeming and provision this, has been removed this you consider to be a major step backwards yeah. why again paranjoy from a corporate governance perspective the section that you quoted 43a which was in the earlier companies act of 1956 if we look at the main reason or justification for it being there it was somehow saying that what is the impact that a company can have on the society so the larger the impact the more the need to kind of uh monitor its operations or to make sure that it is governed properly because typically it was as i have explained in my article small businesses initially started as sole proprietorship then they graduated to partnerships then because of limited liability and the ability to raise more resources add more like minded people private limited companies were formed but public companies were those which could raise funds from the public from banks or go to the shareholders the investors at large so it was felt at least as per my understanding that where the impact on the society is much more they need to be looked at more closely greater transparency greater accountability, accountability. and impact on society All that right. i think is the most so important so you raised eight different issues which have been thrown up let's deal with them one by sure. one firstly the issue of when a top management person what do you say kmp one of the key managerial personnel yes. somebody of the rank of say chief executive managing director cfo <coughs> okay when this person is removed dismissed right. sacked yes. the same person whom you might have earlier praised what are the what is the role of the regulatory bodies and in this case who are you talking about the regulator are you talking about the securities and exchange board of india or are you talking about any other regulatory body what should be the role uh there are two facts uh, two angles to this one is the regulatory body and more important than that is the role of the other board members 
in this instant case or let's say when any senior person is removed, I think it is too much to expect that somebody walks up to him and says, look, we are not happy with your performance, so you resign. What, what does good governance mean? It means that, you know, there should be transparency, other board members. First of all, this person should have been put on guard saying that, you know, these, these are the reasons we are not happy with your performance. Because performance, especially at the board level, is not entirely in your hands. Because sometimes what happens, you might take a good decision and you are working with, towards it diligently. But let's say the domestic industry scenario changes, the international scenario changes. So despite doing everything with good intentions, you may not get the desired results. What you're suggesting, to cut a long story short, before that person is asked, asked to, to leave, leave or sacked, yes. he or she should be given a fair opportunity, an opportunity to explain Absolutely. her or his lack of performance. Absolutely. And that there should be a sort of a transparent process. Absolutely. And here the role of the other board members or senior management. Yeah. So, so this is the second point you raised. Yeah. The superintendents and the control of the board of directors. Yes. What are their responsibility? What is the responsibility in this context? So you haven't mentioned it in your article of the independent directors. And you raise that a similar issue was yes. raised in the case when the managing director of the rating agencies, right. ICRA, formerly yeah. uh, in Indian Credit Rating Agency, was asked to leave. See, basically what I am saying is that as stipulated in the Companies Act itself, the CEO or managing director works according to the superintendence and control of the board. He does not or he cannot or he should not be allowed to work in isolation. So any decision which he has taken has, should, has the backing of the board. The board has endorsed it. So if something has gone wrong, drastically wrong, I am not for a moment suggesting that don't hold him responsible. All I am saying is that the other board members who would have also endorsed his decisions, they are equally accountable. That is why in the case of Ikra, I said that, you know, just sacking one MD because it was perceived that, you know, he kind of played around with the ratings given to one of the companies which uh, boomeranged, you know, uh, infrastructure leasing and financial services. Company, ILNFS, that ILFNS. was a fallout of ILNFS. Yeah. He, couldn't, oh, he couldn't have done it. All alone, there, there is a team which works on these ratings, There are uh, which is supervised by another team, it goes to the board, etc. So I'm saying if someone has fiddled around, then there are other people also there. They should also be held responsible. All right. Similarly, in this case, if the performance of, let's say, CEO of that two of Tata so, Sun. See, see, Cyrus Mystery. Cyrus Mystery. I'm just taking these names for, uh, you know, just to be specific without kind of batting for him or against him or any other board member. Somebody of the stature of uh, executive chairman of Tata Sons has to be dismissed. Was the proper procedure followed? Okay. Is it enough that you walk up to him before the board meeting and somebody says that, look, we are not happy with your performance, so you resign. Okay, got he you. doesn't resign. You, you take it to the board. And the board votes on it. I am very surprised. Then what is the sanctity of board agendas, what is the sanctity of circulating the board agendas well before the board meeting. That okay. is basically to allow the directors to make up their mind. Now, if something is not on the table and something as substantial as this, I really don't know how anyone can vote for it this way or that way. Okay. We are, as I'm saying, we are not commenting right, on the no, merits. The third point you raised was that you argue that it's not good corporate practice to elect a non-executive chairman without prior notice and that two of a large conglomerate. Yeah, basically the same thing same I'm story. carrying forward. How would people evaluate in a, at a very short notice? And the other point in this, in this whole saga now that we are talking about it specifically, uh, using it as a case study, of course, uh, you know, one is always wiser in hindsight. So one thought which crossed my mind was that was it's a good decision for Mr. Tata to have come back, even in the interim period. I got you. Had he not done it... And appointed somebody else. Appointed somebody else, it would have avoided a personality clash. I got you. Today, what has become is, it's a clash between Mr. Tata and Cyrus Mistri. It is not a clash between Tata Sons and Ms. Mr. Mistri. I got you. It became personal. It became too personal, which right. could have been avoided. Okay, the fourth point you've already handled that 
Should directors be expected to vote without demonstrating an application of mind and on important matters, significant matters, their accountability their, or their alleged complicity? Exactly. Okay. Because yeah, yeah, please. it would work the both, both ways. Now, in one case, we could say that because they have, didn't have the opportunity to do it, yet they voted. And as you said, in case of complicity, let's say when a company is accused of diversion of funds, which we have seen lately, so many companies coming under the scanner, then how would a director uh, protect himself in, in such a scenario? Okay. If we conflate the fourth, the fifth, sixth, and the seventh points that you made, this whole issue about shareholders' rights hmm. and voting power at a board meeting, representation on the board, you know, I mean, does it, should it, does it only represent the amount of shareholding you hold? And then the question is, issue of division of profits, shareholders' rights, first among equals, who are all equals, all board yes. members, who has the casting vote. So this is another issue and linked to this is should the majority shareholder always have the right to over, overrule the views of the minority shareholders? And what happens if the directors in terms of representation of board, where are they represented? At board meetings. And, and what are the safeguards that are needed to protect the rights and the interests of minority shareholders? Is it merely uh, by appointing their representative of the board? What is the role of independent directors? You know, these, these are a slew of issues which are thrown up. And in the context of the Tata mystery struggle, and you have explained why it is so. Yeah. The total investment in the Tata, uh, in Tata Sons, you know, is a huge amount. Huge amount. It's 600,000 crores, 6 lakh crores. Yes. Now, interestingly, the Shapurji Palunji group, which was earlier represented by Mr. Cyrus Mystery, had one sixth. Yes. So that, that was also so huge, substantial. Huge, 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 huge. It's 100,000 crores, 1 lakh crores. Yes. yes. Let me try to answer uh, the points <coughs> that you've raised one by one. First and foremost, I think what I have tried to convey in my article is at the board level, Generally speaking, it, and this is my view, when directors are taking any um, decision, they, are, they should be taking it only in the interest of the organization, irrespective of the shareholding. You see, th as I have said there, there is a very clear distinction now, that... When you say organization, yeah. and then there are shareholders, then there are consumers, then there's a public. There are various there are various sets stakeholders. Of stakeholders, correct. I am saying the first and foremost responsibility and obligation of the directors is to do what is best for the organization. Everything else flows from it. If the company is profitable, if your decision which you are taking is good for the company, the company is growing, the company is growing profitably, first and foremost, your shareholders will benefit. The company is growing. That means the scale of business is increasing. That means the participation of the other stakeholders like, like suppliers, etc. will increase. Their business will increase. They will also grow. Because you are growing, you are growing profitably. Now we have the CSR, CSR initiative. So a larger part will go for the CSR uh, deployment. So everybody tends to benefit if you are working in the interest of the organization. And legal, I mean legally, it need not be said, but legally if you are doing things right, then every all stakeholders are bound to get a larger share of the pie. The more important thing is that when you are voting at a board meeting as the directors, you should not be influenced that I belong to this group or that group. You have to see the whole. I mean, you are looking, isn't this utopian? It, it is. It's an idealistic situation. No, it is not. Because otherwise, no company, no company will be able to work. All right. You cannot do this that you look, I am doing this because my shareholders will benefit and he takes a decision. It has to be a collective decision. It has to be, a decision has to be by consensus. And that is only possible when everybody is wearing the same hat. All right. Now elaborate on the points you made on yeah. shareholder rights, voting power, majority, minority and the big issue you know if Shapurji Palunji group has one lakh 
crore investment yeah. in in out of the total investment of 6 lakh crores in tata sons can they claim that they are being oppressed can they claim that you know they are minority shareholders and being oppressed and and uh, therefore their their uh, rights uh, have to be uh, protected well they can definitely claim but as we said at the beginning of this i we i think it is better not to get into the legalities okay. the point which i was making in my earlier <coughs> uh, point also was this that whatever happens happens for the general good of everyone concerned the only difference is who gets how much of the pie depends on his shareholding but that does not influence the decision in the board i am not too sure whether i am making myself clear make yourself clear the shareholders rights the voting what power I'm at the board is, meeting what i am saying is okay let us the interests of the organization the public interest let us, and stakeholders no, interests let me put it slightly differently you just mentioned about independent directors now independent directors don't hold any shares in the company right now does it mean their voice doesn't count for whom are they voting for whom are they exercising their discretion they are doing it for the good of the company similarly or for the public no th that is what i just explained per enjoy you that believe that company works is... well if the decisions okay. are in the interest you, of you, the organization you argue that the public would be benefited they will be benefit one can disagree but let let's move on yeah i mean one can do that but all i am saying is if the pie becomes bigger legally then every stakeholder gets a larger share in that pie so when any you at a board meeting a director should not be only influenced by in the by only the interest of the group that he is representing right. he should be working towards the towards you may, making you the uh, pie That's bigger good. and then of course he will also have a uh, bigger share out of that but it cannot be me versus you or somebody versus against someone else it has to be a collective process that is the whole purpose of having a board that is why you call it board of directors you don't call it board representing so much so uh, the shareholders okay <laughs> ultimately it is like that but it has to work as a very cohesive unit all right that is the point i am trying to make okay let's move on yeah you uh, in this article you shared your own personal experience yes. because you know when you yourself you were working you were the cfo yes. of tata telecom yeah. and on one particular occasion uh, the shareholders had passed an enabling resolution authorizing the board to raise its share yeah. capital yes. and its debt yes. up to a particular limit and then later much later years later when the companies one uh, the same company wanted to enhance its paid up share capital by way of investment including a foreign Partner. Investor, foreign partner. I think yes. you are talking about that Docomo. No, this was uh, Lucent Technologies. Lucent Technologies. I stand corrected. Now, the proposed enhanced capital was well within the limits approved by the enabling resolution. Right. Nevertheless, the company was advised by a senior legal advisor to go back to its shareholders yes. as a good corporate practice, yes. and in fact, the company did that. Yes. and today you are saying that the venerable house of the tatas which had at one point of time too many epitomized good corporate governance ethics morality values their image has been badly tarnished yes. with this all the muck that has come out in this tata mystery tussle yeah and that is in fact it takes back to the earlier point i made that good values have to be imbibed from the very start now this learning for me it was a sterling example of good governance i learned this example 20 years back but it has stood me in good stead all through my life i'm saying this is what transparency is this is what accountability is this is what good governance is that even though something is not mandated by law it is not required by law still you do it because that generates a lot of trust and trust is the backbone on which all relationships work whether they are domestic official commercial anything the, that is a, that was a great learning experience for me paranjoy uh, because it tells you that look you earn the trust of the others you tell them to look i don't need to do it but i am doing it Thank and you. then people you know they really uh, appreciate that and they it helps you in your work later on also because you know these people are going to support you they understand you thank because you of what you have done earlier thank you so much mr sarvesh mathur for giving us your time and for explaining 
what you believe are the most important governance issues that have been thrown up in the legal tussle between Ratan Tata and Cyrus Mystery, which is currently in the Supreme Court. And that was whistleblower and former chief financial officer of PricewaterhouseCoopers talking about the letter of the law, the spirit of the law, and what constitute good governance. Thank you very much for being with us and keep watching News Click. Thank <laughs> you.